Now you say it was developed in the late 20s and early 30s by Dr. Viktor Frankl in Vienna. Yes. Now what is Dr. Frankl's relationship to other Viennese psychiatrists such as Sigmund Freud? Well, uh, Dr. Frankl <coughs> was a student of Dr. Alfred Adler, yes. who in turn was a student of Dr. Sigmund Freud. So there's sort of an apostolic succession here. Well, it's sort of, therapy is sort of the grandchild of psychoanalysis. I see. Now what especially does Dr. Frankl say that perhaps differs from Freud or Adler? Well, Freud says, among many other, I mean, I have to simplify this. Yes. Uh, Freud says that the main motivation for living is the pursuit of pleasure. I see. The, the pleasure, the, the pleasure the, principle. The, the pleasure says, principle. Yes. We have a will to pleasure, yes. and if this will to pleasure is repressed, then we become neurotic. And Adler agreed with this, but went a step further and said not only the will to pleasure is important, but also the will to power. And that's sort of some of the concept back of the Nazi movement, isn't it? That this will to power is something that people have and it was pushed out from that? Well, the, the, it's, it's more uh, perhaps the, the Nietzsche, uh, the Nietzsche concept, philosophy. which is of course, uh, the Nazi movement picked it up on a, in an unhealthy way and uh, logotherapy, and Adler picked it up in a, in a, in a therapeutic healthy way. Way. Yes, all right. There's certainly a therapeutic way of this will to power as well. Yeah, well, we all grow up as powerless little children, surrounded yes. by giant adults. Yes. And all our life, Adler thought, we are striving to overcome this inferiority complex. And, yes. And this is part of our striving for to achieve something. Yes. Now, uh, Frankl... So, so Frankl is something different from either of these. Well, Frankl accepts both. Pleasure is pleasurable, power is important. But pleasure is only important as a, uh, if you don't go after it directly. Power is important, I mean, pleasure is important as a byproduct. After having right. found meaning, you feel pleasurable, you feel pleasure. In other words, Frankl's first principle then is not pleasure or power, but meaning. Yeah, the, the, the will to meaning is, mm -hmm. instead of, is the main motivation for living and for acting. We want to find meaning in our lives. But life today is so full of uh, oh, fear, things, fear of war, fear of uh, being a hostage in Iran, fear of losing your mate. Uh, there are so many fears. How, how does this principle of finding meaning and relationship hold up under conditions of stress? For instance, in Frankel's old life, did it hold up under a condition of stress? Well, it not only holds up in conditions of stress, but it is absolutely necessary in conditions of stress. And this is why we, all of us, are much more concerned with meaning now than we were in Freud's time. In Freud's time, we were com concerned with sex and with pleasure, because this was repressed. Now, sex is not repressed so much anymore, but meaning is repressed. Now, in this theory of logotherapy, how do you get the meaning? What techniques do you use? There are so many people nowadays that say, I cannot help myself because my mother did this, or my father did this, my father was an alcoholic, my mother never loved me, I grew up in, 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 in these terrible situations. Now, there is nothing that you can do to change your past. But again, there is something you can change your attitudes towards the past. You can either let the past drag you down, or you can take it as a challenge and learn from it, from this experience. I, I remember there was a, a woman who, who said, my mother never loved me, therefore I cannot love anybody. And she was very isolated, very lonely. And she had no gift and her for relationship. excuse was her mother never loved yeah. her, so she could never love. And, and during the logotherapeutic uh, the therapy, she was she was led to to change this attitude from my mother never loved me therefore i unable to love un, i am unable to love to the new attitude my mother never loved me therefore i know how painful it is not to be loved and they make a special effort not to spread this unlovingness any further so you see the situation is the same the mother never loved her in either case but the attitude either was to say i have to be lonely or i make a special effort to reach out so we can't change our heredity and we can't change the environment that produced us, but we can change our attitude toward this and we can change what we are doing about this today. This is the message of logotherapy, therapy by meaning, by relationship, that you are not just a 
helpless product of circumstance, that you can do something to change your life, whatever your circumstances. Now, I wonder what this sort of thinking would say to so much of what is being preached in America today, for instance, by Robert Ringer, who writes a book, You're Number One, and who emphasizes do your own thing, pursue your own interests, pursue your own needs, and sort of really, uh, who cares about anybody else? I'm number one. What would logotherapy say to this point of view? What? I, I, excuse me, Jeff. Okay. Um, I think, first of all, the idea he has is a good one, and I mm -hmm. think we all need to learn to take care of number one and to pursue our own interest. Mm -hmm. However, no man is an island. We all need to have each other in order to survive, and we all need to have our support systems, if you will. And this is where logotherapy fits in so beautifully, because logotherapy is a support system, something that we can turn to, that we can find comfort in, and through logotherapy, reach, help us to reach out to other people if we've had that difficulty before. And I'm sure if anyone has gone through the experience of, I'm number one, I'm out for me, I'm not going to, you know, this person, that's their problem if they're suffering, I think very soon they'll find that they've isolated themselves and become very lonely and they don't have much meaning in their life because you do need to have other people in order to find meaning. So it's important to uh, have a caring for yourself, but it's important to move beyond that to these relationships that exactly. nourish you. Exactly, yes. exactly. Now, logotherapy <clears throat> um, stresses the choice. If you have a choice, you will find meaning. If, you feel in, if you're in a situation where you feel you have no choices, you're trapped, you will feel meaningless. So it's very important in groups or in logotherapy in, in general, if you feel trapped, to list all the choices that you still have. But, and this is where the number one comes in, I can do whatever I want. I make, I have a choice and so I do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. But Frankl stresses that the choice isn't enough. Mm -hmm. the, the reverse side of the choice is responsibility. You have to use your choice in, with, with a sense of responsibility, with a responsibleness. And his idea is responsibility, really responsibleness in a, in a literal sense. Life is asking us something every moment, we, and we have to respond to the meaning potentials of the moment. Now, we are all here in the same situation, but each of us has, has a, diff it's a different demand is, is, uh, is uh, um, asked for us. The meaning of the moment for me is to explain logotherapy. For you, it is to draw me out. For, for Penny, it is to, to tell something about what it means to know us. And to every one of you listeners, will find a different meaning. Some of you may be intellectually interested. Some of you may hope that something that we say will help you in a problem. Uh, some of you will find that hope that we say something that will help to some, for somebody that you care about. And if you make a choice, you have to respond to this meaning of the moment that is offered to you. You have to really, res being respons able to respond. And this is, I think, where where this doing your own thing falls short if you don't, if you just do it regardless of what it happens to others. I can respond very much to that sense of that when I don't have a sense of choice, I feel the meaning goes out of life. Yes. That uh, I get trapped into situations where I find I, I get out my little uh, appointment book and everything's booked up there and there's no room for anything anymore. There's only responding in that moment to that person and the next one who's coming. And I'm very conscious that I had my own need to set aside one day a week as a Sabbath. One day a week in which I could really do what I wanted to do, that I could make the choices for that day instead of having choices imposed upon me. And I gather it's that sort of making space to, for your own affirmation mm -hmm. and your own ability to choose your own relationships that is part of what logotherapy yeah. is saying. Well, this, this brings us to, to something which is perhaps the center point of logotherapy. When he says, Frankl says, that we always have choices under all circumstances. We all are free to, cho to choose. And the reasons why he can say this is because he includes in this freedom of choice not only the freedom to choose to change a situation from a meaningless situation to a meaningful situation. But if, where this is not possible, there is one choice that nobody can ever take away from us, and this is the choice of our attitudes. We can take a meaningful attitude towards a meaningless situation. 
we can have several attitudes for, to a meaningless situation. There are innumerable uh, case histories that I could tell you about where, where a, a completely a, a change of life comes about by a change of attitudes. I see some similarity between some of Frankel's thought here and some of the thought that comes to us from Eastern religions. Mm -hmm. I think especially of a famous Zen Buddhist story now where the monk is chased by a ravenous tiger and the tiger comes leaping after the monk and the monk falls over a cliff and he looks down below him and there is another ravenous tiger and he looks up above him and here is the ravenous tiger and he's hanging on to a little bush and the bush is just loose and it may come at any time and he sees one strawberry growing on the bush and he reaches up and he picks the strawberry and he eats it and says how delicious now, I gather this would be similar to what Frankel would recommend in such a circumstance. Well, I, I suppose with some, with some uh, I think he would, he would go beyond that and would say, all right, the strawberry is beautiful, but how do I get out of the situation? Oh, he would also <laughs> deal with getting out of it, all right. But uh, you are right, uh, there is a great similarity between Eastern religion and, and Frankel, and also between Western religion and Frankel. When, was, when Frankel was in Japan, they always tell him, oh, what you are telling us, uh, we, we know from, the, from, from our Zens and from our, from our scriptures, mm -hmm. that's old stuff. And when he was in America, his, uh, people said, what you are doing is qu quite new, it's quite different from Freud. So he said he is quite, quite happy about that he has something which is old and proven and still something new. So, it, so it's interesting that some of the ideas of logotherapy seem to be very much akin to the old teachings of this Eastern religion, but quite new and different from some of the proposals and therapeutic methods put forward by Sigmund Freud. It is rooted in common sense, and I think this is what makes it valuable. In other words, it's rooted in what really works. Now, I notice you mentioned the use of logotherapy in prisons. I recall in your book you mentioned a visit of Viktor Frankl to San Quentin Prison. Would yeah. you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Well, uh, I, I had arranged Frankl's visit, and there was a speaking tour, and we had, we had mapped out a, a schedule. He was here only three days, and there was a, speak, a speech every day, and there were television interviews, and there were a lot of things to be done. And the second day, when he, was, he spoke in Marin County, uh, a, a, the director of San Quentin came to him and said that one of his prisoners had read Dr. Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, and it had changed his whole outlook of life. And he had heard that Frankl was in the area where Frankl could possibly make time to visit him and talk to him. And to our great consternation, Frankl overthrew the entire a schedule that we had mapped out and made room, had made time to go uh, to San Quentin and I went with him and it was an unforgettable experience because he, he talked to that prisoner and as a result of this, uh, this talk to the prisoner, the next time he came, it was arranged that he talked to all the prisoners that wanted to hear, to hear him. So I was with him in San Quentin twice and I have described this in my book, it had, had, I had quite a a great insight in what prisoners like to like to do with their lives. That was the first time that that some a psychologist came to the to the prisoners and instead of telling them uh, you are doomed because you have this terrible upbringing, your parents uh, were, were were neglecting you, you grew up in slums, you, slums and societies against you. Here was a man who said. And this is again a message of logotherapy. Regardless of what your background is, of what your your your, your drawbacks are, you have it within you to take a stand against this drawback. That's why he called this last speech he gave in, in November the, the defiant power of the human spirit. Sort of a Promethean thrust here. You're going to hold up your courage to the gods. And that was very important for yes. the prisoners for, to hear that they're still in their terrible situation 
they still have some power left to change their lives if they want to. Yes, well this again is an affirmation like in his own experience of the concentration camp that in any circumstances you have at least the choice of your attitude to these circumstances. Yeah. And again he was very effective because these prisoners knew that he was he had been in the same situation. He not only was in prison, he was on the in the shadow of a gas, gas chamber as they were. So the human spirit is beyond the givens of the pleasure principle, beyond simply seeking power and overcoming inferiority, but is on a constant quest for meaning and relationship. For our guest today, we have had two people who are very concerned with that quest for meaning and relationship. Penny Parsons, the vice president of the Institute for Local Therapy, and Dr. Joseph Fabry, the director of the Institute for Logotherapy. I'd like both of them to have just a few seconds for a closing comment, whatever they'd like to say. First, Penny. Yes, I think the most important thing about logotherapy is it's, it's really a way of living, and what we do is help provide the tools for people to, to have a better life. Thank you, Penny. Well, what I very often say that logotherapy, at least the way we apply it, it's not so much for the mentally sick, for the, but for the mentally searching. So this is a therapy for well people as well. It's, it's, a, it's people for well people who feel empty, frustrated, trapped in transition periods, but basically not, not sick in the, in the strictest sense. Thanks again to Dr. Joseph Fabry and Penny Parsons of the Institute of Logotherapy, 1 Lawson Road, Kensington, California, 94707. I'm Dick Bokey saying thank you for being with us on East Bay Live.